Does he kiss my hand anymore like we used to? No, we just blow each other kisses now, don't we? Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're live and welcome everyone to in existence. <laughs> Hope everyone's doing all right out there tonight. Uh, we've got a great show tonight. We've got some great guests. The return, actually, mm. of our guests from last week. <laughs> Hope my... everyone's doing all right out there tonight, Jason. Uh, we've got a great show. I'm, I'm totally ruining You're having bad luck with technology today. I'm having a bad night with technology. But we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Um, no, Jean, I haven't. Thankfully, we're here. Uh, but look, yeah, last week, uh, the week before, actually, was a great show. Yeah. With, uh, mm -hmm. It was last week's, wasn't it? Um, well, we, no, we were, we were off last week. It's the week before. Yeah. 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 Before. Sorry, I'm, I'm miles away. I'm going to get it together now. But we had a great show with William Steele, true crime writer, author, mm -hmm. uh, writing from his own experiences. And um, as I'd said before last week, he's uh, you know an advocate for um, cr violent people witnessed uh, victims of violent crimes, um, terrible crimes really. And um, he's here today with his fiance, uh, Dr. Mary Bass. V welcome, mm -hmm. uh, Mary. Good to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you're here because you're an important part of oh, yeah. this story. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to hear your side of how you met William and how you got into, um, you know, helping these people. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I know through your own experiences, and that's the important part here is that you all know where all these people are coming from because you've been victim to these, you know, crimes. And so, Mary, I'll let you start in your own time where you want to start with how, how, how you met William? Sure. I, I met William through a gentleman named Tom Madden, whom I had telephoned and asked about public relations services. And Tom Madden is really, a really friendly fellow. And he asked me if perhaps I would like a pen pal. And I thought, well, fantastic, because I love writing letters. And fairly soon after that, he gave me William's information. But prior to giving me William's information, smooth Tom Madden sent me an email where very indirectly he encouraged me to buy three books. The best sales email ever. Fantastic. I immediately went to Amazon, bought all three books. Didn't know really what any of them were going to be about. Uh, my mom got them. She read them first. So she commandeered them. And then she gave them over to me. And with William's first book about Robert Durst, mm -hmm. uh, my mom handed it to me. And she said, you know, Mary, I have a feeling that you're going to really like the man that wrote this book. And that you have some things in common with him. So no, oh, that's pretty interesting. And so sure enough, I, I read the book and I wrote William's letter and I explained how his bravery with telling these truths and what were supposed to be kept secrets from these very wealthy, powerful and dangerous people, his bravery um, gave me a good dose of bravery, which I needed to come forward and tell the truth about um, some very dangerous and powerful people that have unfortunately ingratiated themselves into my life and into my family's life and have been victimizing us. Mm -hmm. So William's book gave me a lot of strength and encouragement that I, I ordinarily wouldn't have received so i'm i'm very grateful and i like his second book as well very much i don't want him to think that i'm playing favorites here no it's okay play favorites all you want that's fine <laughs> so then william and i got to uh, talking on the phone and at first i figured you know he he's a published author he's a much more fancier than me. I'm just a lowly forensic accountant and data scientist, which I swear it's way more exciting than it seems. And I know that's <laughs> a problem still. I know. 
But um, right away he was in touch with me and was very friendly and very genuine. He has had a very genuine concern for my mother and I and our circumstances that we had in California. And we are uh, beyond blessed and very grateful to have him in our lives. And so, of course, we, we thank Tom Madden every time we call him. And uh, although his main business isn't matchmaking, I don't think it would hurt him to take up sort of a secondary career with that. Because so give, far, give me a side hustle. Yes, exactly. Right. Bottom line: uh, Tom Madden was the vice president of NBC in New York, and now he has a company in Boca Raton, uh, public relations transmedia group in, in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. He's a personal friend of mine, and she was looking for representation for an incarcerated client mm -hmm. and Tom introduced us and the rest is history. Now we're engaged it's a year in and I couldn't be happier. And I thank you guys for having us on during this Valentine's day weekend. It's very appropriate to have a couple on a newly engaged couple, by the way. Yeah. So thank Aww. you for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's go. adorable. Yeah. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. Amen. Just for clarification, though, because I I, I had, did have the question the the similarities that y'all had uh, that, that you know when your mother handed you the book, it was about you know av victim advocacy, not not that you had spent time as an international jewel thief being Catwoman or anything, right? No, I, I don't have any experience in uh, in jewel thievery. Okay, okay, just checking. Uh, yeah, no, you know, no. You know, I would have told like, you. They'll have a lot in common. Me. Like, wait, is it the victim advocacy or is she Catwoman in a past life? Like, repelling <laughs> down from, you know, that, with the whip and Batman and all that. You know, you never know. You got to ask. You never know. That's right. That that was my line. If if uh, your audience knows oh, from reading my books, I was uh, unfortunately in a previous life a pretty prolific jewel and art thief, and uh, millions of dollars stolen across the you know the cars of country and looking over my shoulder and a lot of personal loss, incarceration. And, after taking some college courses and getting into uh, uh, spiritual matters, I basically had a real change of heart and turned my life around. And and with her help and encouragement, you know, I'm writing books now and trying to put these stories out there, mm -hmm. advocating for victims, advocating for the victims of Robert Durst, um, victims of wrongful incarceration, victims of uh, Gillian Maxwell, victims of Prince Andrew, um, mm -hmm. and in whatever way that I can can do or expose them and my experiences with these various people. So Mary has been doing this before I met her, uh, helping a wrongfully incarcerated individual and other people that were wrongfully accused. She's worked with some high profile attorneys in California. And so that's what we have in common is that my change of heart led me to want to help people that are victims or wrongfully incarcerated. And she was already doing it before we met. So that's, that's pretty much we hit it off. We're like meant to be or something. I don't know. We have our struggles like any other couple. But you know what? We're in love and we work through them. So. Yeah. Well, like, like you say, you, you know, you're doing the same thing, which is a, you know, a great connection to have. That's right. Because, yeah. because this, um, you know, mission that you're doing, it, it's, it's full on, isn't it? I mean, you have to put a oh, yeah. lot into this mm -hmm. yep. to, to be able to pull these things off and the research and the supporting people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a big task and, you know, it's great that you've two have got support of each other. Uh, to be able to do it, because uh, I don't think it's an easy job mm -hmm. on your own, uh, trying to fight uh, no, these big people, you know. It's not too easy, and in my case in California, uh, the more elusive that suspicious people were acting towards me, the more curious I became about who are these people and what have they been up to all of these years. Um, just very quickly, in 2016, my uh, beloved stepfather was murdered, and it was a mm. money-motivated murder, which was orchestrated by his accountant, Terry Miller, a stockbroker, Don Vincente, and a purported attorney named William Coleman. And my stepfather was the nicest man you ever could have known, and mm. it just uh, it devastated my mother and I quite terribly. But I refused to give up on finding out who did this and why. And that research into who are these strange people that won't speak to me 
that led me to find a case that was very much buried in the court archives. And that's the case of David Michael Reinhardt, who is a victim of the same organized crime faction that murdered my stepfather. And oh, wow. th unfortunately, uh, law enforcement was false pretense in 2003, and it resulted in David being uh, shot at for about 16 hours in his childhood family home, which the whole scene is very odd. It's this big mansion on the golf course, and uh, he was being retaliated against because he was trying to file a police report and follow all of the proper procedures and protocols mm -hmm. because his inheritance was being stolen. And so, unfortunately, that led to a wrongful conviction for David uh, for 56 years, and he served about 18 of that. And so what I did when I found his case was... I, I noticed that he was missing some documentation that was available at the uh, the recorder's office, so it's free, it's public record. So I got as much as I could that I thought could help him, and I sent it to him with a letter apologizing that I, I don't know what else to do. I'm not an attorney. Um, as far as being a forensic accountant and a data scientist, when it comes down to things like tracking down assets or proving financial crimes, then I come in very handy. So I was delighted that he was really grateful to receive the information and that he was willing to share with me his knowledge about these people who were much more dangerous than I could have conceived of um, mm -hmm. and are quite a lot older than I am and that he was helping as best as he could from being in prison to try and give my mother and I some advice on how to stay safe, um, whom we might be able to talk to to get help. And um, sometimes those things, you know, trying to get help, sometimes it falls on deaf ears. So mm -hmm. I think it was really a blessing that William entered our lives at the time that he did, because he certainly understands about the law and whom we need to speak to to get help and these things that uh, my mother and I aren't accustomed to. We haven't um, had to deal with uh, with this particular set of circumstances before and from a very, very dangerous corrupt town where it was really just she and I um, alone and, of course, very afraid. So we're, we're forever grateful to William and, and to Tom Madden. Yes, I have to mention him again for facilitating. <laughs> but bottom line, her client, Dave Reinhardt, was targeted by these same individuals and lost because of a fraudulent or a falsified altered trust agreement, tens of millions of dollars, as meant as much as four hundred million dollars. So he's sitting oh, in wow. federal, he's sitting in prison right now in California. And we'd mm -hmm. ask people, uh, you know, people that are watching this, please reach out to him, David David Reinhardt. California Department of Corrections. Um, we could pr probably provide you a link, but the website is freedavereinhardt.com. It has his contact information there, free Dave, Dave Reinhardt. And so we're working trying to get him uh, a forensic uh, uh, document examiner who's certified in California to help him with, with some of his, his legal issues. The same people targeted Mary's mother, mm -hmm. this racket, and Fresno County. Um, was known very recently as being the, one of the most corrupt counties in the United States. Um, many of the probate people involved with these probate frauds and rackets were mm -hmm. arrested a few years ago, and now there's still a core. Uh, there's a core of them still mm -hmm. actively doing this. What they didn't realize when they, you know, apparently killed her stepfather, and she's got some evidence to this that who her mother was not alone. Her mother had Mary. And with Mary's mm -hmm. background investigating these frauds and being a member of different organizations, not law enforcement, they picked the wrong victim. When they picked Mary's mother to victimize, it might have been like a burglar going into a house of a sleeping SWAT detective who was, you know, had the day off. You know, he picked the wrong house. When they tried to, they already stole the house from her mother and they're trying to steal another, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. They picked the wrong victim when they chose her mother because they didn't realize how proficient she is. So she was able to build a prosecutable RICO case against them. And they started retaliating with falsified accusations against her and all kinds of stuff. 
which is still going on. So enter me. Yes, I know a little bit about the law. I was a law clerk. I'm not an attorney. Um, and this guy, Dave Reinhardt, was able to give her a real good history of these people that did this to her mm -hmm. mother because they did it to him. And then one after the other, we're finding more and more people this happened to. So it's not just the the let's say the the more civilian aspect of it. There is a there is a uh, an official on the county level. There are officials with legal authority who are who are aiding and abetting yes, the, these absolutely. crimes. It's not just you know individuals off the street. These are people who have this is a this is a very well connected on the on the governmental level. Yes, and absolutely. Which, which is what's allowing them to do this. Absolutely. And she has a documentation to prove it. She doesn't just talk and say, I think, I think, I think. She has a documentation to back up every mm -hmm. word, last word she's been saying. The problem is you can't get anybody out there to listen because they're all seemingly in bed with each other. So, yeah. But they're all quite upset that I have all of this documentation. All of mm -hmm. it was obtained legally. Um, mm -hmm. Usually with white collar crimes, there will always be an extensive paper trail. And right. then when people involved in those crimes start to get a little nervous that maybe they're being investigated, they try to conceal the crimes with even more paperwork, which makes yeah. it more obvious to me what they're up to. So, mm -hmm. they, they, so one of the parties, we're not going to name at this moment unless she wants to, generated a fake order, fake email, which her service provider already verified long ago and turned it over. The service provider that she didn't generate it, and they still tried to accuse her of generating it. I mean, it's just one thing after the other, retaliation, guys with guns showing up at her house, mm -hmm. uh, uh, something from an insurance company, you know, life insurance, somebody placed a life insurance policy on her. Without uh, my knowledge. So I was glad that at least the life insurance company made me aware of that. Uh, you know, there was a fraud going wow. on, but it's um, it's just it just goes on and on, and it's been it's been quite horrible. Um, it, it's a tricky matter because we didn't expect we would be targeted, or that my stepfather would be targeted. Um, this wasn't any sort of a massive estate where I I can't conceive of why all of these so-called professional people would commit so much crime and take so much risk over a rather modest amount of money, except that they're never held accountable. And just like Dave mm -hmm. Reinhardt, who tried for many years to get a police report filed in Fresno, I have tried for <laughs> several years to no avail. Um, and they get uh, a little bit testy with me if I ask. But the bottom line is, and we're, you know, in this venue and others, we're putting them on notice. The FBI is aware of what's going on. Other federal agencies are aware of what's going on. The attorney general's office in California is aware of what's going on. And decent attorneys are aware of what's going on. They didn't like the fact that she met me and I have a PR mm -hmm. firm that I work with that'll help me out to bring any attention onto any matter. They didn't like the fact that the second I was getting released from prison, I was offered a TV show on a major network and we've already filmed 10 episodes mm -hmm. and this is going to be brought out as, on there as well. So I'm doing my part because it's the right thing to do and I love her, but right is right. And it's what I do anyway. So, you know, we are a good fit, you know, we're able to help each mm -hmm. other. I came out clueless about technology I couldn't figure any of this stuff out right here that we're doing today if it wasn't for Mary, but I could also read people and I know how to work, you know, uh, in a, in a straightforward, uh, direct evidence-based fashion with law enforcement to try to help her present the facts in a proper way to them to start taking things seriously that she's been complaining about. Um, so that's where we are with that. And bottom line, I helped them get out of California. We're in a, we're in a new location, which is near um, Chicago. So we're just outside Chicago. And I'm from New York City, as you know, you know where she's from. And then we met here and met one of the biggest swindlers in Midwest history, accused allegedly, Charles Ray Smith. <laughs> he posed as my friend. This guy mm -hmm. posed as a benefactor, helping me getting on my feet. I had a TV show already. But I was getting on my feet. I didn't have the basics. I didn't have a phone. I had nothing until Mary mailed me a phone and a, and a laptop. And 
you know, I've been locked up 18 years. So this guy posed as a friend and then proceeded to try to sell us a house in, 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 in this area that he didn't own, tried to sell us. A, she was diagnosed in California with a leukemia, tried to sell a fake cancer cure. I said, Mary, I'm starting to get suspicious about this guy, Charles Ray Smith. Can you please do your due diligence and see what he's all about? And she found he's already been litigated against successfully mm -hmm. and had tried the same thing with numerous other people. Fast forward, the FBI finally arrested this guy after decades of robbing, allegedly, millions of dollars. And he's now facing 130 years in prison for wire frauds. And virtually every victim has had death threats leveled against them, including mm -hmm. me, including her, including a celebrity, uh, which is going to come out in a few weeks. Um, he was planning to kill approximately nine people. His girlfriend, who turned his cell phone into the police, turned up mysteriously dead after saying, he's going to kill me for turning in this phone. Now, he's admitted to several of us that he did, in fact, murder her. He's not charged. I'm not saying he's guilty of it, but everything points to it. So this is what's going on now. And so Charles Ray Smith um, has been now linked by several of the victims to other murders. That's Charles Ray Smith. If you Google Charles Ray Smith, Elkhart, Indiana, he was an uh, informant for metro, uh, numerous agencies. He was working undercover, uh, making fake cases in some cases. I don't know if any of the cases were real. But we're finding people that he set up that have been entrapped by him. The case of Dr. Uh, Leslie Marlin Scholl, Dr. Scholl mm -hmm. is one of them. He just did 13 years, lost a million and a half dollars to this man. His gun collection, two three hundred thousand dollar gun collection, due to entrapment. He said he was going to kill his wife. It turned out it wasn't true. They dropped all those charges, but then for some tax stamp on a transfer of a, of a legal silencer that wasn't done correctly, mm -hmm. they gave him. 15 years in prison. He did 13. He just got released. Mary and I are working with Dr. Scholl um, to try to get on his feet, rebuild his life and set up a crowdfunding for him to get his medical license back. And she could explain a little bit more about, about how this guy, Charles Ray Smith, entrapped these different people while he was working as an informant. Charles Ray Smith, um, he it really irks me when people just refer to him as a white collar criminal and infer that because of that, he's less dangerous. It's been my experience in my life based on things that have happened to me and things that I've seen. Mm -hmm. A lot of so-called white collar criminals are extraordinarily dangerous because they will do anything, go to any extremes to not be prosecuted for any crime. Um, oftentimes, if they work at a bank, for example, and they were to lose their job, well, then if they're part of financial racketeering, then they're sort of out of the gang because the first step in money laundering is placement. So you have to have the crook banker in place. Mm -hmm. You need a crook accountant, a couple crook lawyers, mm -hmm. maybe a judge on the side, some sort of a goon squad. And Charles Ray Smith, he does a lot of these things on his own from what I can tell, but um, he is, I, I just, I don't even know, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist or anything, but he only cares about self-preservation, clearly. He has zero remorse for anyone that he has scammed or had incarcerated, including Dr. Scholl, who, did nothing except start requesting uh, that his money had been defrauded out of be returned. Right. And Dr. Yeah. Scholl has lost so much time. Um, Dr. Scholl has five children. I believe he told me that when he went to prison, his youngest son was six years old and the oldest child, a daughter, was 15. And I don't know if they're aware that, that this was a setup. And it just is, it's, it's horrible. It's, it, it's, it's heartbreaking and it's horrible. And mm -hmm. it's very, um, it's devastating, isn't it? Your whole life has been taken from you, everything, mm -hmm. your livelihood, your family, your home. And then you're in prison for 13 years for something that you haven't done. You went set, set up by this Charles Ray Hall. Smith. Mm -hmm. 
Smith. Smith. Sorry. He he deliberately entrapped him because the man was complaining. I'm going to go to authorities. You swindled me. He's a, he's mm -hmm. a Christian guy. He was going to let it go. So I want my money back. Instead, he swindled him, set him up for a fake murder for hire, which they dropped because somebody in the Justice Department recognized it most likely for what it was. So somebody had mm -hmm. the decency to drop the most serious charges. I can tell you from doing time and being a law clerk, they don't just drop murder for hire charges. They let them go to the jury, let the jury figure it out. They dropped his charges in 2009 and slammed him on a transfer of, of a silencer. OK, but the man tricked him. He was going through a divorce. He said, I'm a gun dealer. I'll store all your guns till your divorce is over. Well, when he let him hold the silencer, guess what? You didn't do the paperwork. They sent him to prison for that. So that came fruit of the poisonous tree from an illegal. Uh, you can't go to prison on a crime that was created in the mind of an informant. And the informant in this case, Charles Ray Smith, who also posed mm -hmm. as a Hells Angel biker to try to intimidate victims while operating as a as a CI for God knows how many agencies. Um, he may have made legitimate cases. I'm not taking anything away from the, the authorities' right to use informants. But you have so many people saying they were handed a laptop by this guy after he stole their money that was loaded with child porn, and then they go to prison for 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. when, when the feds go pick up the laptop that this guy allegedly gave to them. So this is on and on. He's also bragged that he hides his money in LLCs, that he had one of his attorneys set up these fraudulent LLCs. Mm -hmm. In this country, they're limited liability companies that shield him, um, and he's hiding all these illegal assets. So you have a bunch of pictures of vehicles, bikes, jewelry, a big gigantic mansion he has uh, not far on the river here that he bought with all the victim's money, which is not all, now all seized to some degree by the feds, but they're protected by LLCs, even though they were fraudulently set up. You know, he would yeah. brag about it. He, he would do it to keep the the, uh, the money out of the hands of his victims, out of the hands of the feds. He used to brag about that all the time. It's this guy is just, uh, he co-opts the criminal <laughs> justice system here. Friends with detectives. I don't think they're on the force anymore. And who knows, you know, what else went on there? I don't know. I'm not making accusations, but it just was an incestuous situation where they allowed him to rob senior citizens. In my case, I had to act like I liked him and I tried to like him. I tried to be a decent guy to him. I brought my pastor over to his house to try to help him because he had some surgery on his foot. And all he did was use the pastor, use mm -hmm. me, uh, try to get manual labor out of me, um, ridicule me, talk like a filthy mouth guy in front of my, my woman, a little disrespectful where I come from in New York to talk like that in front of somebody's woman, you know. But so I did try to be a friend to this guy, but he tried to sell my girl poison and, and sell us a house he didn't own. So mm -hmm. I had lost all respect for him. Now we're friendly with all the victims and and we keep trying to find more and there's just there's so many um yes which it gets frightening at a point because i wonder how many of them are wrongfully incarcerated that we haven't stumbled across yet which is the same dilemma i have with victims in california how many have i not found yet how many were murdered by this right. syndicate right. It's, or uh, committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, or okay. committed suicide because their lives were destroyed. We I found mean, one. That, yeah. We found one that doesn't get out until like 2033, and he was suicidal for years. And his mother, I think she either killed herself or had a heart attack over this. His mother, Charles Ray Smith's mother, and a sister was writing people, um, some of the victims, Doctor Shaw, one of them, saying because. Dr. Scholl was living with Charles Ray Smith's mother, caring for her for over a year while he was going through his divorce, never knowing that every time he went in the safe for his property, gold coins were disappearing, the coin collection disappearing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over a million dollars disappearing. And then because it was a fake murder for hire in the divorce, his wife got another six or seven million dollars, got everything, even though it's a community property state, it was supposed to be 50-50 split. So, be But because of that, even though he's never convicted, the man come out, he's destitute now. And, and I'm struggling because I just get out of prison. I'm, I like to think I'm doing well, but the reality is I'm struggling to get on my feet. I've been blessed to have, you know, two books that are doing well uh, by telling mm -hmm. the truth about my past and, and to have her on my side. I, I just enjoy help. We enjoy helping each other tell these stories and helping people. It's very rewarding to have victims on the phone, you know, but I think because we put so much stuff on the internet, um, that there's so many people coming forward saying, hey, you know, my son's uh, death has ruled a suicide, but no way because of this, that and the other thing. Uh, 
you know, all these cases are coming to us that are like overwhelming us because we're not the police, but we have a heart to help people and we're trying to find out the correct way to do it. You know, mm -hmm. how do we how do we really help people investigate without stepping on toes or pissing off law enforcement? Um, I think there's a way to do it cooperatively to get, gather evidence and turn it over to them in the right way. That's what I think the end of this is going to be. Mm -hmm. And she helps she helps a lot with that as well. So. And I was going to say that um, Dr. Scholl, although he's not practicing medicine right now, mm -hmm. he loves people and he loves his patients yeah. and Great, his career. Beautiful person. You know, I I can't imagine anyone nicer, really, except for my late stepdad. <laughs> um, I had told my mother, I said, Mom, when you meet Dr. Scholl, he's going to remind you a whole lot of Larry, <laughs> who's my stepdad. I said, it's just really remarkable. So for Dr. Scholl, um, through Indiegogo, I'm putting together a crowdfunding campaign, um, a little different than the norm, because of course he needs to get, Dr. Scholl needs to get back on his feet. Mm -hmm. So we should all help Dr. Scholl get back on his feet. And at the same time, he's eligible to have his medical license reinstated, yeah. which is a costly endeavor, but very worthwhile. And our intention is to make a docu-series about this whole process. Mm -hmm. So my plan is to launch the crowdfunding site as well as video content, audio, and some of the perks and the excitement and the pizzazz, if you will, uh, next Sunday. So I'm very excited. <laughs> Well, and I yeah. really hope that we can help him and that other people will have compassion for him and be willing to help him as well. And I hope that, um, I mean, of course, he can't get that time back that he's lost. But I really hope that his his children, who are all adults now, will just be willing to hear him out. Yeah. Their minds were poisoned against him at such a young age by you know the the authorities at the time and by charles ray smith's bs that was geared just to enrich himself um that they just don't even know their father anymore and i reached out to a few of them on his behalf because i know what it's like to be separated from your kids because of my cross racing and you know sort of vindictive exes i'm going through something similar but i did what i did to get to prison i'm guilty of what i did this man went to prison innocent and lost mm -hmm. his kids because they were only fed a steady diet of your dad's no good. He tried to kill me, you know, from, from the mother, I guess, and whoever else. But it was no truth to it ever. It was created in the mind of this guy, Charles Ray Smith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just really heartbreaking to, to think that somebody's going through what I went through, yet being innocent. I had right. all this guilt, torn up with guilt that, of, of me not having connection with my kids because of things I did. And I'm still trying to reconcile with my adult children now because their minds have been so twisted by, you know, exes are never going to see much, much good in us. So mm -hmm. I guess the exes that I had only saw the, the worst. She's only hearing about the worst and really hasn't witnessed, you know, much of it. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> well, it's just life, isn't it? How, you know, we try and get better, don't we? We try and learn from That's our mistakes right. and That's try right. and try and move mm -hmm. on and, there's nothing we can actually do about what we've done. And the, the best thing is to try and, like you say, move on and do your best now. Um, we, we, we can change. We can be different. We can, you know, learn from our mistakes if we really want to. And, you know, you are an example, great example of someone who's, you know, you. done a lot of time in prison, uh, you know, hung out with the wrong people, into drugs, you know, the, the worst things we can think of. But actually as well, you don't know about people's life and why they're in that situation. You know, and we judge too quick. And I know ultimately you, you were judged mm -hmm. and you went to prison, but, you know, just to the things that you did. But there's reasons why we get to these places. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to sit there and judge people and go, well, you, mm -hmm. you're a thief and you can't, you know, learn from your mistakes. Actually, you, you're showing yourself to go mm -hmm. completely the opposite end and helping people now which is, you know, an amazing thing to do because there's actually not a lot you personally get from, there's no gains, personal gains with this when you're mm -hmm. helping other people other than, 
you know, hopefully feeling like you've done some good. But people yeah. don't realize actually there's there's more for the other people. You're doing it more for the other people than for yourselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's rewarding to be able to turn this around and help people. I've been invited already to speak at a couple of colleges. Um, and I, I took university courses when I was in prison. And I'm getting ready to take some people up on those uh, other book signings for my uh, Gillian Maxwell book that just came out, um, Sensational and Impure. And uh, so mm -hmm. things are going well. I mean, I'm just trying to figure it out. And without her, you know, unfortunately, you know, I do put some pressure on her, you know, because I have that New York let's go attitude. And, you know, not everybody's on that that dynamic, although she's super confident. It's uh I need to start learning a lot. I can't keep putting everything on her and I'm learning that, you know, we're learning to, uh, that we all have our strong suits. So, but I would never get through the technology or the, mm -hmm. the confusion of this new world and how to avoid catfish, even simple things like that, because various people, I had a guy pose as Brad Pitt and, you know, you know, asked me for money to call him. And I'm like, wait a minute, why, why do you need my money to call you? And then my New York, you know, mentality came out. I said, okay, I'm going to turn his tables on him. I said, oops, I accidentally sent you 10 grand. She said, you got it. He's like, who's she? I didn't get it. Where did you send it? <laughs> and then I eventually said, I just sent you another 20 grand. Did you get that? You know, and so you know, many scams. But like you say, you've been inside so long. You're not aware of the current yeah. stuff that goes on. You know, technology, like you say, mm -hmm. phones. I'm pretty sure you've seen. You've come out to see technology completely. Oh my God! Before, forward. before if you talk to your remote control, you were crazy. Now, if you don't talk to it, you're crazy. I don't yeah. do anything without talking to my remote control first. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you went in, you had like what a one of those Nokia's that you know lasted for 150 years, and now now you come right. out with smartphones. Right. I never saw a smartphone. Yeah. I was only on the internet once. That, yeah. When I escaped yeah. from prison, they put me on America's Most Wanted uh, website. And it was no big deal, but that's where they put me because of my history of stealing expensive things. So I, I was first time I was on the internet. I was at a mall. I was at a kiosk. I wanted to look up the status of my escape and my wanted poster was staring back at me. I didn't know what I was doing. So in all these years, that's the first and only time I've been on the internet until I just was released about 11 months ago. So this is a whole new world to me. <laughs> and so it's a, uh, it's been a challenge. If it's okay, I'd like to point out um, that William has been helping people even prior to his release, mm -hmm. even though in, I would say, certain ways he was penalized for doing so and for telling the truth. Um, for example, he knew of a, a young man who had, uh, was wrongfully convicted and a false confession was elicited yeah. and... Uh, William did all he could to make sure that uh, that young man was set free, and he was. And these are not easy endeavors to take on by any means. I think the risk is greater if you are incarcerated and you're trying mm -hmm. to attempt this. I face a lot of risk mm -hmm. and backlash in the free world and a lot of, uh, I would just say, uh, uh, safety problems. Um uh, an attempted kidnapping at gunpoint. That was the most memorable one that stood out um, in broad daylight at the grocery store up the street from my house in California. And after that, I just sort of stayed in the house. And uh, I mean, uh, like I say to my mom, I say, we're experts with uh, quarantining because we've been doing <laughs> this for years uh, out, of, out of safety necessity. Mm -hmm. so, but, um, but Bill is so, very inspirational, so I'm very grateful to know him and to learn as much as I can from him. And if he wants to learn about data science or forensic accounting <laughs> taxes or, or insurance, I, I'd love to talk about these things. Also, if anyone has insomnia, I highly recommend they get a hold of me, maybe through William's website, because... <laughs> I mean, I may need to have you on. <laughs> I mean, to have you on. I'm actually, I'm in, uh, I'm an escrow officer for a title company in my day job. So, like, everyone's like, forensic accountant was that? I'm like, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> let's talk, let's talk insurance. Um, 
<laughs> but I'm not gonna. I won't bore our our uh, she Daniela's was, poor. She was saying her voice is so relaxing, like without even trying, it like literally puts people to sleep. So yes. she's always teasing me. She said, "I don't know how you're gonna like my voice. I have an ambient voice." <laughs> the human ambient. <laughs> She'll talk hey. about taxes or nonprofit investigations. It's like, always the nonprofits. The IRS yes. nine nine to easy for them. You can all laugh at me now, but I'm telling you that. Is where the scandal is. She's an expert oh. in investigating financial and tax crimes. Yes. Expert. Oh, don't even get me started on nonprofits. Don't get me started on that. I'm, I I'm, get you I'm right there Jason. with you, sister. All right. I want to get you riled up now. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. So, But something that I think Daniela's audience would be more interested in, there seems, I'm noticing a pattern in the stories that you're telling, right? which is there does seem to be an undercurrent of corruption in law enforcement at the I, I'm, I'm playing this down versus what I want to actually say. Um, but it does seem like law enforcement is intimately involved in all of these people who are, who are going to prison. Uh, oh, we just lost Daniela again. Okay. <clears throat> well, howdy. Welcome to Jason. Welcome to uh, Jason McLean's hidden existence. Uh, <laughs> it's been, it's been fun, Daniela. Uh, no, she'll be back. Her, unfortunately, her internet it gets wobbly. She's in, you know, overseas in Britain. Um, but it does seem like there's a, definitely a, a a a commonality of uh, of corruption in law enforcement it, it, for a lot of these things to go through. Am I hearing this correctly? Is that is that does that seem to be popping up a lot more often than it should? I w- want to say this real quick. I have friends and family in law enforcement, including federal law enforcement. So I will not say they're all bad. I even as an ex-felon belong to law enforcement supporters groups. Oh, of course. Yeah. Some of them don't accept me. It's the bad apples that do these things that get the false confessions or beat the hell out of people that make it look bad for all of them. And the poor guys have a bad, hard enough job to do, you know? Right. No, just, absolutely. Absolutely. But it also seems like it's not a, just, well, it's not just the FBI or DEA or, or local. It sounds like this is going all the way up to judges. It's prosecutors. They all seem to have to have a hand in this. Again, not everyone. I I know. I've I again conversation for off here. I happen to have known some people who are again they're friends of mine. They're high up in certain law enforcement agencies. Mm-hmm. I understand what you're saying. It's definitely not anyone. Everyone. That's but right. that being said, the more you get into it, the more it's like it looks like there really should have been a lot of steps along the way, where law enforcement and that goes up to the judiciary. And prosecution should have been able to step in and go, hold up, this there's something wrong here, and they didn't, and they didn't because they knew what was going on, and either turned a blind eye or are profiting from it some way. Maybe it's not directly, but indirectly profiting from it. Is, is, am I am I hearing this uh, correctly? Just, just like the making of murder, a case, uh, Brendan Dassey and uh, Avery. Um, Dassey, his confession was he was a young sixteen year old and. Uh, not all there uh, educationally, I, low IQ, and yeah. every mm-hmm. fact he gave during his confession was fed to him by the detectives. Right. Courts have overturned this, and on a higher court would just leave the, the kid in prison. Knowing mm-hmm. he did nothing wrong, they leave him there. So whoever did this is still free, whoever raped mm-hmm. and murdered their, the victim of this case. In her case, this corrupt law enforcement involved because – They've been out to the house off duty, roided up with guns in their hand, banging on her thing, going to her house, tampering with her video cameras, mm-hmm. you know, while trying to talk to her about, you know, generic things related to the probate court. Why mm-hmm. are you even touching? That's illegal for a, an officer to a detective to touch her you know, surveillance cameras without a warrant. Um, mm-hmm. And that's per the FBI. You know, they're, they're not allowed to touch them. So they keep showing up with guns off duty. Mm hmm. Um, I really think trying to trick us to open the front door, which, yeah, that wasn't going to happen. No. Uh, I'm not yeah. going to try and make it any easier. Um, but I, I definitely don't think that all of law enforcement as a whole are in cahoots. Oh, of course not. Yeah. Like that. I have met some very nice law enforcement professionals in my mm-hmm. lifetime. I have also met some that uh, treated me very badly. But even in mm-hmm. those circumstances... I never was bitter towards all of law enforcement because I just figured it's impossible that, you know, everyone is in on it, so to speak. And different areas have different situations with 
with bribery and judicial right. corruption and how it trickles down. And a lot of that um, uh, methods of finding indirect proof of financial crimes, I kid you not, they're in the IRS 990 easy forms. Mm -hmm. And so really a lot of these uh, folks are telling on themselves by filing those with the IRS. They're public oh, yeah. records. They just don't like that I know what they're talking about in those <laughs> So, well, right. it, well, most people don't even. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Particularly with the news media that we have, they're not going to look at. They don't. They don't. They most people just don't understand how a lot of this stuff happens. Particularly when you when you talk about nonprofits, most the. I, okay, I won't say most. I will simply say many, many. But particularly if there's a celebrity involved, all those nonprofits are complete. They're just they're they're frauds. It's all fraudulent. I mean, just straight up. And that's not you saying it. I'm just going to say it. If there's a celebrity involved, it's a fraud. But but yes, nonprofits are, are one of the easiest places for uh, for a lot of this stuff to go down because people don't look at them. And it is boring, to, to your point. A lot of people aren't going to be like, wow, forensic auditing. You know, it, it's, it's not really a movie people are going to watch. Nothing gets right. my blood boiling more than if they didn't file them on time. That's the first clue that things are afoot. Because they're mm -hmm. really easy to file. And then I see who's on the board of directors, this and that. And there's so many that are just used as money laundering. Oh, vehicles absolutely. Of sorts. Well, know, that insurance. Uh, yeah. Nonprofits and insurance are the two ways money is moved off book. And that is on the criminal level and that is on the governmental level. We, I'll, we leave, personal... I'll leave it there because I ain't going I'm about I ain't about to show up dead somewhere. <laughs> We're personally aware. Mm-hmm. She said she believes you. I, oh, yes, I, am oh. I used to work for a company called ISO Vera Risk. Beyond that, I won't say anything else. Uh -huh. We're, We're personally good. aware of an organized crime group where the, the leader of this group in a section of California has nonprofits, and what he's doing is raising money and then to launder money and mm -hmm. then giving part of it right back to the police for body cams and, you know, bullet yeah. bags and body <laughs> cameras, but it's really the kickbacks. Yeah. That's you what know, it is. Don't, don't name them on there, <laughs> but yeah, this is, it's, it's crazy. In fact, one of the things that uh, she's digging into with uh, Robert Durst and uh, inappropriate money being funneled, uh, let's just say in the direction of California before and during his trial. Also with Gillen Maxwell, a lot of impropriety with nonprofits. So that's going oh, to be yeah. coming out soon. And whatever she turns up with, um, not only are we going to turn it over to the Southern District of New York, the prosecutors, uh, it'll be in an upcoming book. <laughs> so interesting. Um, so it's just follow the money. And I'm way more interested in the nonprofits than people's yes. personal taxes. They think I'm looking for their personal taxes. No, 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 no. That's cut and dry. Yeah. I want to say there's non-profit taxes. <laughs> right. I'm telling you, there's a lot of hot gossip and scandal there. One day, <laughs> somehow, someone will believe me, even though I know taxes only become exciting and scandalous during election time. And even right. those aren't real tax scandals, but I digress. I better stop because yeah. <laughs> he's going to fall asleep. Well, so, so I'm going to have to have you on because like, this is the kind of stuff I do like to talk about. Again, I'm a nerd that way. I'm right there with you. Most Oh, Danielle is back. Sorry Hi about there. that. Hey, hey. Yeah. Just, no, we, we yeah. were talking about taxes. It was wonderful. All oh, right. Oh, that's interesting. I'm sorry <laughs> I missed that. But yeah, no, to your no, to her point, uh, yeah, most of most of the tax scandals that the news media goes after aren't actually tax scandals. It's the fact they don't understand taxes. The real yes, and, which goes back to my point, the reason they don't go after a lot of these nonprofits and the insurance stuff is because it's so complicated to explain. And mm -hmm. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. They leave it alone, and it's like that's where the real crime is. Like, isn't that isn't that how they got Al Capone when they couldn't get him on anything else? It's <laughs> my, so okay. I have two. Okay, this is completely off topic, but I feel it's like I get it. It's like we got a murderer on tax evasion, but I'm like, we got a murderer on tax evasion. What what kind of crap is that? It's like, like it's like nothing wrong. I'm I'm of two minds. I'm like, I'm glad we got him, but at the same time, I'm like, but. We got him on taxes. We didn't get him on actually the things that he was doing wrong. We got right. him because he didn't that, fill out a freaking form. I, right. But it gets him off the street for X amount of years. Yep. Maybe they can build cases. Maybe witnesses feel yep. more safe coming forward. You know, so there's oh, yeah, a lot exactly. of purpose to get, get him on what you can. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. If they're using this Charles Ray Smith as an informant or a witness still, 
more power to him if they think he's making legitimate cases. I don't take that away from their right to do that. However, the first time he went to court in October, he perjured himself. The judge swore him in to ask him to tell the, tr tell the truth about his living arrangements and his situation before deciding on a bond. Tapes were played where he has threatened days before to kill numerous mm -hmm. people who were victims of his to eliminate them from this federal case. When he, when he was asked about his mobility, because he did have some surgery on his toe, he had lied and said he's been in his bed for three years. Mm -hmm. That man's been to Tennessee, Florida, and everywhere else. He directly purged himself minutes after the judge swore him in. So that alone should eliminate him as any kind of informant because he's perjured himself in federal court just, just 60 days ago, you know, almost. I mean, mm -hmm. he's living way beyond his means. His some kind of form we found on public records said your usual employment, unemployment. <laughs> so yeah. was, he, uh, he's was... living in, 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 you know, beautiful mansions in the town he lives in, driving Vipers and Vets and sports cars from the 50s and 1920s and a warehouse full of Harley Davidsons. That's one of his uh, touring cars. Oh, wow. That's one of his bikes out of many. There's probably 30 or 40 of them. Um that's more of his bikes at one of his bar locations in Elkhart, Indiana. Um, that's one of his bikes. He claims that's a skeleton of his best friend in the background there. That looks more like a medical specimen, but oh. God bless him if it's a guy. That's in his place where he says Garth Brooks and Bon Jovi routinely play there. They're friends of his, he claims. Um, you I'm know. telling you, Bon Jovi's name has gotten drugged through the mud so much. From this Charles Ray Smith. That's part of uh, Charles Ray Smith's arsenal. Those are barracks. Those are powerful enough to take down airliners. Those are machine guns that he sleeps right within reach of his bed. He goes outside with four or five guns on him at all times. They supposedly seized all these uh, as a condition to let him out on an ankle monitor. And then he, tr he tricked the judge to get out of that, saying he needs a surgery. And now they put him on a voice monitor. Now he's trying to claim that uh, they wake him up too much with the voice monitor. He wants to get rid of that, too. Right after he's threatened to kill everybody connected to this case, he wants all these devices. That's him showing off his, some of his stolen jewelry. Um, I don't know who that watch belongs to. We have one that Dr. Soul identified as being his Rolex. Um, he's showing off his jewelry, sending pictures. He sent me a picture of his dead ex on her kitchen floor, Trina McCreary, um, Who's he's suspected of murdering. We don't know. Allegedly, he did it. He says he did it, though. He's told people and he did it. Um, as a warning to me and others, if you ever talk to the feds about me, you're dead. You know, I'll bury you where you stand. Not just me. He's said it to several people. Um, so this guy's living way beyond his means. They should charge him with tax crimes. They should charge him, in my opinion, with perjuring himself in federal court. The judge had mercy on him. God bless the judge. The prosecutor heard the tapes. He said, look, I would normally agree to a bond on a, on a wire fraud case. It's a white collar crime. But all these death threats, we can't ignore them. I'm asking for detention, Your Honor. Fantastic prosecutor, fantastic FBI agent on the case. Mm -hmm. And and the, and his, his side said, well, he just boasts a lot. He's this, he's that. Yes, that's what con artists do. They boast a lot, you know. But you're letting a man go on a signature and a GPS monitor – into a community that's oblivious to who he is. They're oblivious. And, and some some of them, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's young people running in and out of that house at all times. I'm not going to go into a lot of other things he's suspected of. but And and he's just there, living there. They took his guns. It's, so many people want a piece of this mm -hmm. guy. And he's just living there, waiting for his case to unfold. While the victims are like, why is he even out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. did a fantastic interview on ABC I think you have a picture in the studio of of us, that's uh, Mary and I, with uh, with one of the journalists there. Um, you'll see him. That's uh, Tim Spears, Emmy Award winning journalist at ABC, where she did an interview. I think you have the link for your your watchers if they want to click in. But yeah. she did a she did an interview on ABC News and a bunch of other media outlets are about to cover it. Uh, about my Ghislaine Maxwell book, we have an interview tomorrow. We're going to bring up uh, Dr. Scholl and what happened with this case here. That's your book there, the Ghislaine That's book. my most current book. It's uh, available yeah. on Amazon. It's uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, Sensational and Impure. It's at my uh, my story of my unfortunate relationship with Ghislaine Maxwell years ago in the Palm Beach uh, in the Palm Beach mansion, mm. Palm Beach, Florida. Um, and uh, and this one that was out before that, 
Uh, that one I just that, yeah. that's right. That one was about my uh, acquaintanceship with Robert Durst. He was the wealthiest serial killer in American history. Everybody said I'll be sued if I publish it. I published it. Everything I said in there, he eventually admitted to in court. He just died of COVID in prison in California. Mm -hmm. um, I ask you guys to please keep Kathy Durst and her mm -hmm. family, uh, the McCormacks, in your, your your thoughts and prayers because they never got justice. Uh, Janine Pirro and so many people didn't prosecute him when they had the chance years ago. Come to find out, somebody's donating a lot of money to campaigns and try to mm -hmm. allegedly prevent a prosecution. You know, so he, he's he's worth a hundred million dollars. He's sitting. He was sitting in jail, and now he died in custody after he was convicted. And unfortunately, California law, even though he was convicted, while the appeal process was pending, if you die, you're you're completely exonerated. So now, in death, he's exonerated. Yeah. So I notice there's a lot of litigation about to unfold because mm. the people who have enabled Robert Durst for so long um, need to really take care of the victims, surviving family members, including the McCormicks, because it's not fair what happened to them all these years, 40 years fighting for justice. Uh, it's terrible, isn't it? The right way through yeah. the courts with attorneys, not, you know, doing anything improper. And yeah, it's yeah. just. Uh, Gosh, it's just so awful. It, it is. It really She's is. Very yeah. sensitive. I, I love her. She's so sensitive, and she has such a heart for people. And despite my facade growing up in New York and Brooklyn, I really do as well. And I hate to see people suffering. And I wish there was more of us to go around because now that we're really coming forward with this more and more constantly, I, I'm getting banned from <laughs> from Facebook at times. So like momentarily yeah. for posting too much. I don't know the difference mm -hmm. from spam to like just hey, I'm I'm here. Talk to me. I'll answer your questions. I don't. I'm learning things you can't do. It's nothing inappropriate, yeah. but I'm kind of repetitive in, in what I'm putting out there. That mm -hmm. I want to help people. I want to spread the word mm -hmm. about what we're doing. Um, to your point, real quick, Jason, if I could about yeah. corrupt cops. There was a case I assisted when it, it was uh, Tim Brown out, out of uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Black guy. Mm -hmm. He was about I think 15 or 16 years old. Mentally challenged. Low IQ. Was riding a bike with his friend. Two, three in the morning, somebody else went to a Circle K and a cop was writing a police report. A deputy Behan, his name was, and executed that guy. That basically got his attention. He turned, he shot him in the face, kills the cop. He gets away. When they put the perimeter up, they arrest these two young black guys. And guess what they did? They held they held them for however long, a day or so, and beat coerced confessions out of both of them, gave them life sentences for murdering Deputy Behan. They were innocent the mm. whole time. That's one of the cases I testify for the defense because I found out who the real killer was. ATF did a sting operation on the real killer. And he admitted on the outside that he did it. He was a detention deputy, mm -hmm. allegedly killed him, but he admits on the ATF under undercover investigation right, yeah, yeah. that he did it because you know they, they couch it like we need a drug courier, we need a hitman. And he, oh yeah, I'm the guy that killed Behan, blah, 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 blah. So he's confessed to people that he did it. To this day, he's not charged. But I went to federal court. I told my side. The ATF testified about what their case was all about. The judge uh, sent him back for a new trial. And they had no evidence at that point because the confession was yeah. beaten out of him. They let Tim Brown go free. Thank God. Innocent guy helped him get out of prison. He was wrongfully incarcerated for life. But after 18 years, he went free. Mm -hmm. Another case, a uh, guy was getting framed. I did the same thing. I found out about the guy framing him. Um, so, you know, I, it's not that I just want to see people like Charles Ray Smith held accountable. It's that when I see something wrong in the system or broken, I try the right way to rectify mm -hmm. it. The officers in that case, the Tim Brown case, if you look it up, they had beaten falsified confessions out of mentally challenged blacks for a very long time, including a single tender, single terror, forget his name, charged with rapes and murders of black prostitutes all through Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in this case, I may be confusing the cases because there were several of them. Guy was on death row, gets exonerated, but the real killer continued doing it. So they were even right. putting the wrong people in prison while the real serial killer continued. Even though and, they, well, and this goes back to the, sort of the, the question I asked earlier. Like I said, it's not even about, like, everyone's familiar, I think, with the idea of the corrupt cop. But it's the other corruption. It's the it's the prosecutors. It's the judges. It's It's not just, you know, some corrupt cop isn't just out there doing things there's a whole line of people who have to be involved mm -hmm. and understand what's happening to do this i mean that's 
That's the you real would, issue here, isn't it? You would think the checks and balances would work, but many times they don't. They just don't work. It seems in Dr. Scholl's case, to some degree, they did because they hit him with murder for hire against his wife and his, his divorce mm -hmm. attorney. After his arrest, as part of his plea, they dropped those and then just the tax thing on the silencer. But nobody drops those serious charges unless they recognize we screwed up. Listen to this informant. Mm -hmm. You can't go to prison on a crime that was created in the mind of the informant. He can't oh. commit. He can't create right. the crime and have you go in his mind and have you go commit mm -hmm. it and then turn you in. That's but how trap. many? But how many people like Doctor Scholl or didn't have a as either attorneys as good as Doctor Scholl? Or had access to the resources of Dr. Scholl that got that got oh. railroaded the same way that Dr. Scholl was going to be railroaded. His his attorneys, according to him, were part of the problem. Didn't listen mm -hmm. to him. Didn't do a thing he said to help him get exonerated completely mm -hmm. early on. Nothing. In fact, once he was screaming about the corruption and the and the fake informant that locked him up and set him up like this after he stole a million and a half dollars from him, after he screamed about that, they put him in the hole in the jail with no communication. The man nearly had a nervous breakdown until he agreed to take a plea. As soon as he take a plea, then they let him out. Mm -hmm. He posed no threat. He's a gentle giant, this guy. He's a very sweet. He posed no threat in population. Nobody was going to mess with Dr. Soul. But they locked him up until he took his plea, which is coercive tactics. Right. And the sheriff notified him, prosecutors run this jail, basically. They tell us what oh, they yeah. do. They want you locked up. Well, we're seeing that with. How fair um, is that to lock you up until yeah. you break? You know, yeah. Well, that's the, that's that's torture. I mean, that is actual legally that is considered torture, and it, yeah. we're seeing that. And I'm I'm going to be very vague here. We're seeing that with a certain other group of, of individuals uh, from you know, who have been locked and isolated for a year for something as simple as trespassing. You know, I mean, we're seeing this kind these kinds of tactics in a lot of places in a lot of ways, and it's one of those things where it just shows that there's a broader corruption. Again, it seems like the FBI can pull up anyone they want at any time to find an awful lot of people yet there's an awful lot of thing people who for whom they've committed really heinous crimes like Durst like Epstein like many others and yet they they're completely oblivious to all of it right. you know the money I mean money yeah. money man money money says it all the money um, yeah I was gonna say you know the, the amount yeah. of money that's going around to, to keep all this mm -hmm. going. Mary, just... Mary, you know, doesn't talk about it much, but she does want to share something today, right? Yes, it's, it's okay with you. It's fine with me. Okay. I just feel, you know, whatever you feel comfortable putting out there. She had an oral experience with wrongful incarceration. Yes. Right. Um, this was started in 2008 while I was living in uh, Silicon Valley. And mm -hmm. it wasn't a secret that certain segments of local level law enforcement in that area would target people who were either quote unquote foreigners or who they thought had, let's say, an un-American look or foreign look mm -hmm. and shake them down for money and property because a lot of people are afraid to complain against the police uh, for fear that things will get worse. Well, I may have a certain look about me, and maybe I don't. Um, my dad was from New York, and my mom is a blonde lady from Canada. But I look how I look, and Jason, that's how I roll. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this started in 2008, and um, I was attacked by many police officers and held at gunpoint for nine hours. They had a pre-typed confession they wanted me to sign. Um, Literally. <laughs> uh, filled with very bad intel, which makes me a little wary of people who say they work in the intelligence community. That's a whole other conversation we're going to have to have offline. I'm not even... <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah. Their intel in this matter were uh, two men who were brothers who had uh, prison priors. They were on parole. They were active gang members, and they wanted to shake me down for money, and I said no. So they were married to the sheriff's daughter, so they understood a little bit about how the system works and how they mm -hmm. can work the system. Then they're in the district attorney's office. Oh, that Mary, watch out for her. She's nothing but trouble. She's dangerous. And, spoiler alert, she's not from California. 
She's from Iran. Oh. <laughs> now she's got dual citizenship. She's American and Canadian citizen. Yeah. So that's well, how we've I'm already going. established in a, on a previous show that Canada doesn't actually exist. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a, it's a it's a mythological place. So I'm already skeptical of you now, lady. Let's just. Well, that's uh, why you can't find uh, Bigfoot because that's where he's been hiding. So you better get with the program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm mm -hmm. I'm certainly from California. Um, I even asked my mom a few more times just to really, you know, sort out <laughs> yeah. the situation. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't sign the confession. Instead, I wrote in uh, my own handwriting that uh, these people who will not identify themselves, who may or may not be law enforcement, um, are asking me to sign a confession to things that I don't understand. What I do understand is that at the time I worked in commercial property inspections and uh, yeah, I was not involved in anything exciting, which is sort of the story of my life, and I like it that way. But nevertheless, um, they took quite a lot of money from my home. They didn't have a search mm. warrant, arrest warrant, nothing. Uh, I did file an, a, a complaint with Internal Affairs. My friend's husband was a, I'll say, a proper policeman who encouraged me to do things the right way. He said I'd probably get retaliation, but if someone didn't come forward, then even more people would get victimized. So I did the right thing, and uh, the retaliation was quite severe, and I was held for about three years with no charges. I did have uh, a private attorney. Let, let, let me let me say this real wow. quick, if I can. She ended up, after this was over, they stole her money, tried to get a fake confession and all that, uh, terrorized her. Uh, she went to Canada because she's dual citizenship. They came after her, what was it, several months later in Canada? Yeah. They um, lied to the people up there, making out her out to be they uh these local detectives from northern california you know it's not the fbi or anyone i mean they're local detectives they duped the rcmp encouraged them to establish a task force which <laughs> sounds like that costs a lot of money and takes time and manpower i'm basing that on uh, the uh hordes of people that flooded my one bedroom condo in toronto <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the task force was supposed to be a crackdown on terror. Well, sorry, I'm not that scary. And because of the Canadianness, I'm actually mm -hmm. really polite. Then they accused me of violating the Geneva Convention. Now, I'm not the <laughs> sharpest tool in the shed, Jason. I admit that. So I asked Geneva Convention, does this have something to do with, I don't know immigration or something like that. And they said, yes. I said, didn't anyone tell you that I'm Canadian? Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. Then the guns started backing away and then it was friendly from there, but the RCMP was uh, very upset that, not at me, thankfully, that, that they had been duped by these California cops mm -hmm. who were really showing up to try and shake me down for even more money. The California detectives lied about her to the RCMP to bring her back to the States. And they were livid when they found out she was not a Canadian citizen. It was a nothing charge to begin with, um, a nothing incident, and that she had filed internal affairs complaint against them and expected retaliation, which is why she left for a little while. And she, they yeah. tricked the foreign government to retaliate on her. Mm -hmm. My California lawyer knew that I was in Canada. He said, it's fine if <laughs> they ever do want to arrest you. Um, we'll know. And then we pre-post your bond and you come back and it's not a big deal. It's cool. Okay. I'm a pretty easygoing person. But yeah, so I've had my own little uh, experience with the system there. Although um, even after that, I, I'm still very much convinced that there are tons of really great people in the law enforcement field. I would just really like to meet more of them. <laughs> but the thing yeah. is, I don't want them freaking out and hearing some crazy rumor that, you know, <laughs> scary Mary with the terror. It's like, no, 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 I'm very yeah. nice. So <laughs> I, I have got to meet mm -hmm. some really, really nice professional folks uh, with regards to the Charles Ray Smith case. Mm. I was so excited. They treated me like just a 
a regular, normal human being. So much appreciated. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Whereas Dr. Soul is reluctant to tell him, you know, any more of what happened because for years he's been screaming of his innocence from prison and nobody would listen. And I'm like, well, no, you can trust these guys. And he's like, well, they, you know, it's some of the same agencies that put me there. I said, but it's not the same people. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the people were. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get involved with that because, you know, precarious legal ground. We're helping him with practical concerns and, and presenting his case. Right. But I do know some of the people that want to talk to him are very decent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But he's, you know, has reluctance because of his experience, as does Mary. She's, she's scared, well, you know. Yeah. I mean, have more of a fear of, of local police, particularly in California, uh, especially after finding out that uh, there were so many people involved with trying to murder my friend and client and fellow victim, David Michael Reinhardt, while he was unarmed in his family home. So mm -hmm. I would... Yeah, I prefer not to get shot to death by the cops. And I understand they can get false pretense into bad situations by being given bad information. I don't think they have a personal yeah. vendetta against well, me. I don't see no, exactly. Well, well, so so this actually literally just happened to Tim Poole like within the last couple of weeks. He got swatted twice. For those who don't That's know what squatting is, right? yeah. yeah, it's where they call in to the police and say there's a dangerous situation at this place. The police show up. They are ready for a dangerous confrontation. People have been killed by the police officers in these cases. Like swatting is, is essentially at this point attempted murder and should be it should and should be seen. So it's like if that can happen that to someone be. like like Tim Poole, who is a who is a celebrity, he has a he has you know, hundreds of thousands of views, you know, a month on his channel. If someone like that know, can get swatted, who... then anything could happen to us. Oh. You okay. know, to the average person who knows what they can get away with. Right. I've been afraid of swatting for quite a while now, especially with the California uh, predicament. And um, if that were to happen, I'm quite literally helpless against it. Yeah. And it seems like there's not a, a surefire way to prevent it. There, there was a uh, there was a, a point in one of these issues of retaliation she was receiving for helping mm -hmm. people and building racketeering cases where to get documents, they asked for a nighttime service search warrant. Nighttime services for like violent people, felons with guns mm -hmm. or dope or something. They suspect, you know, if they don't do a no knock warrant, here she is freely talking to the police. She's got talking to the FBI. She's yeah. talking to the detectives. We have a PR firm. She's in touch with them all the time, and they still apply for a nighttime warrant. Why would you apply for a nighttime warrant unless you're trying to kill her in the middle of the night by saying she did something inappropriate when you came through yeah. the door? That's what that was in that case. A nighttime warrant they I'll saw for her. Because yeah. you, I didn't really, you know, I'm very polite, so um, I didn't really want to acknowledge that perhaps not talking to law enforcement could be an option. <laughs> because again, I've gotten stormed by them before and they were very angry. And so mm -hmm. I try and do what they say and I don't want any trouble. I'm, you know, trying to follow the rules here and be courteous. So they know I'll come outside of the house and talk to them if they needed to see some tax paperwork or something like that. I get it right for, you know, just I don't pose any risk. So no, I don't think that they needed to invade our home at night and come after my mother and I. And we still don't know what, mm -hmm. if any, justification was uh, inflated mm -hmm. for that. And also, uh, they've tried to trick me before to come down to the police station to put my prints in their system to talk to them <laughs> about my stepfather's murder. Now, I'm no expert on police procedure, obviously, but I don't think I should have to book myself into the county jail Yeah. so I can just hang around I, 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 for a sounds, few more years while they concoct some sort of bogus charge against me just so I can talk to a homicide detective. Seems mm. a little unorthodox. And the homicide detectives and police in that town get donations and belong to the same organizations that the people victimizing her and her mom yeah. belong to. Mm -hmm. So you can't go to the homicide guys and say, hey, we just left him and he was perfectly fine at this rehabilitation center, we got a call a few hours later, come pick him up, he's deceased. And they won't look at it, they won't investigate it, they won't do anything. The man was in perfect health. He was there for... Was he was it? getting a little physical therapy for osteoarthritis in his legs. Right. 
Yeah. And uh, because yeah. of his assets evaporating immediately after, you know, um, you don't really have to be a, a professional detective to start to wonder, was it a money motivated murder? The stock, right. uh, yeah. the, the financial planner, they used to call them stockbrokers at Stiefel in Fresno. He mm -hmm. was told by her stepfather, put her name, her mother's name on this paperwork, do this, that, and the other thing. They were tricked to move their account there by evidently a corrupt accountant. Moved it into this place where this guy is like connected to organized crime. They, they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And then when the money wasn't, they moved one share of Harley Davidson stock instead of like the other $700,000 of stock into this other account that Larry, her stepfather, directed him to. Yeah, he just wanted everything in a joint account with my mom, his wife. The second he Pretty started complaining ass. about it, you know, he yeah. turns up deceased. So. And the money yeah. Up ever since. yeah. Well, so it's really sad. Color people are quite dangerous, so let's uh, mm. keep an extra close <laughs> eye on them and on this Weasley mm -hmm. uh, Charles Ray Smith as well. Definitely, <laughs> and you know, to keep an eye on the people that are victim yeah. to this because it's the effects, isn't it? And like mm -hmm. now, you just don't know who to trust. You know, you should yeah. be able to go to your local authority. You should be able to turn to a policeman but when you've been stung like that i mean and you lose faith uh you know and trust in all those places that you should be able to go to and nobody wants to listen people would rather listen to the bs about stuff than actually these things that people don't want to face to, to know that actually your, your nice policeman down the road is taking money from you know people to keep stuff quiet it's going on, and the only way you can mm -hmm. uh, yeah. highlight it is to keep talking about it and spreading the awareness. And I know it's a, a dangerous position, a little bit different to Bigfoot. That, again, is like another taboo subject, isn't it? So well, that's why know. we're so grateful for your hidden existence, because trying to bring this stuff out is like a hidden existence. Yeah. yeah. People to pay attention. Not only is it mm -hmm. real, but you have the documentation to prove it. Exactly, and, the, and, the and, it's, and it's very widespread, um, which a lot of people don't realize. And a friend of mine is sort of in a way to pay it forward after his family was victimized terribly. He started a website called stopprobatefraud.com. So they work mm -hmm. as an anonymous grassroots collective helping people that have been victimized by the probate in the state courts or that are under uh, conservatorships or guardianships when they do Oh, yeah. Pay. Oh, that stuff's insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's another scam a lot of times. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to keep trying to spread the word with you, you know, and for you. And um, hopefully, I think we can, we might get to speak to, to David Scholes if he's willing to... Um, come on and share his story uh, i know that's a biggie for him because he's you know i get mm -hmm. how he's i don't care but i can imagine how he's feeling that he's just not going to trust anybody at all Dr. But, Scholes, yes thank you for that I, I, we certainly appreciate that we've taken a real interest in trying to help him get on his feet and tell his story his way um, yeah absolutely tomorrow, i do want to share with you guys tomorrow i have an international media outlet flying out from new york to interview me about my oh, Ghislaine Maxwell book. Cool. And about my story. Um, I can't officially say the source. I think you guys probably caught on the other day who it might yeah. be. Yeah. We won't say anything. I'll be yeah. in the National Enquirer. I'll be I'm supposed to be in the National Enquirer on, on this story on Wednesday, possibly front page. Um, I don't know. I might get bumped off the front page for somebody's hair extensions, I heard. But <laughs> oh. that was the rumor. But yep. and then I think the next day it's going to explode in the media worldwide. This other interview, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think people quite realize how big uh, your experiences are, your story mm -hmm. is. Um, you know, the, the Maxwell thing, the dirt, all, all of it. You're like in the center <laughs> of where everything's been happening, yeah, um, with a lot of things, but. Actually, this is a really big story that's coming out, and your book's really important and, and putting out the truth about things that were going on. There will be links in the description. There's a link to Mary's uh, interview on it was ABC. Um, 
not ABC, sorry, the other. It, 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 it's if you can, I, I don't remember if we sent it to you or not, but if you can, freedavereinhardt.com. We'll do that. We'll send it to me and I'll put it in the description okay. and people can check that out. We appreciate and, it. Um, yeah, well, we're going to have you back if you'd like to come back. Obviously, we, we do want you to come back. You have to serve us some food next time. This is Yeah, like, definitely. You know. Jason will do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump right on that, yeah. We'll, we'll work for food. <laughs> Jason will sort that out. Uh, but, you know, if Dr. Scholes would like to come on, this is what we need is people like him to come and share his story. And he's got support around him. And the only way people are going to learn about stuff is, is listening to what's going on from the people that are experiencing it, not some repeater who's just telling someone else's story, which right. a lot of other true crime authors kind of do. But mm -hmm. you, you actually have got your own stories to write about. Uh, which is even better because it's, you know, it's um, more personal and from for straight from the horse's mouth. You can't get any better than that. Um, I, I was very reluctant to tell them but because of, uh, you know, concerns about certain retaliation. But at the same time, a lot of these things are historical. And, uh, you know, for example, Epstein's dead. Maxwell's been convicted. Durst is now deceased. Um, and my stories in New York of, you know, my, my jewel heist and my art heist and the people I knew there, those are slowly coming out to the degree I'm able to tell them. Um, yeah. And I'm going to help Mary tell her story. And she's wonderful at gathering the evidence and the documents. Um, so shout out to Tom Madden, Crime HQ, and our supporters. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to be getting a lot more, I'm pretty sure. And there's a link in the description to uh, William's uh, YouTube channel as well, because he's going to be putting some content on there soon and he's going to be sharing more stories about his life and what he's been up to and why he's got to where he is now, uh, which is the important thing and what he's doing with his life and, uh, and helping other people. And the same with Mary, you know, the, the effort she's putting in to help people. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to get together again. We're going to talk about it more. But tonight we've... I think we've done all right. We've gone over an hour. Um, it's a lot for people to take in. It's yeah. a lot of information, really. And, you know, we do need to go into detail a little bit more, but yeah. we've got plenty of time and other shows to do that. Um, but I appreciate you both coming on. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you for your thank patience. You. I was too excited and I probably talked too much. I'm very sorry. And Jason, I'm sorry. No, no, oh, no, no, no. Trust me. I, we got to have you on just so we can talk about, like, all the – all the boring tax stuff. I would love oh, yeah. to talk about insur insurance and, and pro trust me, probate fraud, conservatorship. Like we're like, we're going to have that conversation. Like everyone's going to fall asleep during it, but I'm going to, I'm going to have the time of my life. No, there's, there's a target audience for this. And I know right where they are. They kind of lay low because that's risky business too, to be involved in investigating mm -hmm. those things. But, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I just want to sign off with a happy Valentine's Day to everybody and to my beautiful fiance. <laughs> yes, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Um, Valentine's weekend it is the 14th here for me in the UK. So happy Valentine's to me. Um, happy Valentine's sure Day. get loads of cards and cake and chocolates. There's got to be some candy somewhere. I'm going to search. I'll probably have to go to the supermarket for it myself. But hey, you know. It's I want to say hello to the Hazel a supporter in South Africa. And yeah. Kerry in London. <laughs> Kerry, yeah, shout out to Keza. That's right. London. Gary Greenberg, yeah. my co-author on the first book there. Gary, everybody who's been That's a right. part of it. Um, all right, guys. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Mary, William, everybody. We'll um, catch up with you <laughs> Tuesday. Uh, find me on Bigfoot Odyssey. Fred in Alaska is coming on for Larry to draw the Bigfoot that he saw. And I think it's going to be pretty scary. All right, guys, until then, good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you.